So the first uh, question, we'll go over a few questions, a couple, maybe three questions tonight. The, the questions are going to seem very different, but the approach to solving them hopefully is the same idea. Um, so the first question is the birthday paradox. Did I spell paradox right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the birthday paradox, did you get a chance to look at it? Yeah. I Do you have any thoughts on it? I was looking at some... Um, well, let me first, so, so just, let me just say what the question is. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, if you have a room full of people, um, how many, you know, given a certain number of people, let's say you have 50 people in a room, what is the probability that there's going to be at least a pair of people who have the same birthday? So, uh, so if the, uh, if there's one person in the room, there's no way that, there's a match because mm -hmm. it's only one person. If there were 366 people, and let's put, let's not use leap year. Let's pretend there's no leap year. There's 365 days in a year. If there's 350, 366 people in the room, then without a doubt, there's going to be a match because even if the first 365 had unique birthdays, the last person is going to going to have a match. So it's somewhere between zero and a hundred percent chance, and between one person and 366, the, the values will slowly increment mm -hmm. until you get to 100%. So the question is, uh, the birthday paradox is asked a few different ways, but at what point um, is the probability greater than 50%? In other words, at what point would you expect there to be a match, mm -hmm. is the question. So, so do you have any, any thoughts on how to solve this one? So really, what, what you know, this this question doesn't really come up too much in life, but the approach to solving this is very common for other problems. But any thoughts on how to solve it? I have just been going through, you know, different websites, you know, how they have solved it. Okay. By using probability and uh, factorial methods and... Okay. But I haven't seen anything uh, using the simulation in uh, MATLAB yet. Okay, but okay. So, but anyway, like so, one approach to so there there is a way using probability where you wouldn't need a computer to solve it. Um, but since you know we we're kind of focusing on like algorithms and using a computer to solve things, um, one way we could do well. Uh, so, what what questions could we answer? Maybe so. Maybe we can't answer the question: How many people would we need to have a greater than fifty percent chance? Um, by the way, if you had a guess, what do you think it might be? So obviously it's somewhere between 1 and 366, but if you had to just guess off the top of your head, what do you think it is? Um, I've seen the answers. So oh, okay. 23. Okay, but, <laughs> but if, you didn't, if you didn't see the answer, what I, do you I think? I would think it's a higher number. A Definitely. higher number. Obviously yeah. less than 366, yeah. but maybe like 100. But yeah, or... I would think something closer to 100. Okay, yeah. so um, what, can, what can we solve? So let's say, let's say we had uh, N a value of n, number of people, and then a p, the probability. What, are, what do we know? Well, we know this. We know uh, 1, the probability is 0. Mm -hmm. We also know that at 366, the probability is 100%. And we also, we kind of know that if we, you know, as this goes 2, 3, da 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 da, this, as uh, these, this goes from zero on its way up to one, and we just don't know like the increments. But um, what is the problem? So, is there anything we can figure out? What is like, for example, if there's two people in the room, what what would be the probability that they have a match? That two people have a match. If the, so, if two people in the room, and let's just say for argument's sake, they walk in one at a time. The first person walks in. He or she is not going to match anybody. He's the only person there. Mm -hmm. What is the probability that the second person walks in matches somebody who's already in the room? Well, there's only one other person in the room, right? So, oh, we're going to make one more uh, assumption. All birthdays are have an equal chance of happening. So there's none of this. Like I think statistically, most more people are born like in the fall and some other time. But let's just say that's not the case. Everybody, you know, 365 days all have an equal chance. So the first person is just going to have some random birthday. The second person walks in, what is the chance that they match the person who's in the room? So we could actually figure out when n is 2. When n is 2, what's the chance that we have a pair? The second person has to match the first person. Well, that's going to have a 1 out of 365 chance. So, right, so this is 1 out of 365. 365. 
if there's two people in the room. Mm -hmm. So one person it's zero, two people it's one out of 365. What is three people? Would be two or? Well, what, what two things have to happen um, in order for there to be some match? Well, the third person can either match with the first or the second person. Right. Or maybe the third person is irrelevant. Maybe the first two people matched. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so for three people to be in the room, and let's just say for all, you know, we can talk about it easier. If we say the first one, the second one, and the third one. Mm -hmm. First one comes in, doesn't match anybody. Second person might match the first one, mm -hmm. which we actually know. We know the probability. It's, it's this line. Mm -hmm. That's the probability that the first two people match. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have to add what is the probability if they don't match, what is the probability that the new person matches one of them? Mm -hmm. So that's really, and, and so what would that be? That would be the probability that the first two people match mm -hmm. plus the probability that the first two people didn't match but the new person matched somebody. Okay. So what's the probability that the... Uh, one minus? Right, it's going to be 1 minus 1 over 365. And where are these numbers come? Okay, times what? The probability that the third person matches. Does match. Yeah. Which is going to be what? So the new person is coming into a room where there's how many people before him or her? Two. two. So if you're the third person, it's two people behind you. Two people. There's two people in the room, and what is the chance you're going to match one of them? Well, it's going to be two divided by three sixty-five. Sixty-five. Right. Yeah. So. So that ends up being the probability. So. If that's the probability, where are these numbers coming from? Well, this number. Uh, it's going to be 1 minus this number goes here. This number was the row before us, mm -hmm. so this goes here. And whatever number we are, it's uh, the one just before us. So this number, let me draw this like this, this number goes here, and this number is um, days in a year. Mm -hmm. you know, day, yeah, days in a year days that are in a year. So this fraction, whatever goes here, we copy it to here, and then we do... Uh, one minus that fraction. Well, whatever this, whatever this value is, we copy it to here. So it's one minus whatever the, the row right before us mm -hmm. is, and then we multiply it by two divided by the number of days in a year. And then we can figure out three. If we wanted to figure out four, we just take whatever, whatever this whole thing in red becomes, and we do uh, that number plus 1 minus that number times 3 divided by 7. And, and now we have a pattern. So um, we, can, we can solve this on Excel if we go like this. Um, let me just slide this over. And so what I'm going to do is basically just do that pattern. Um, so we can just pick a, a column. We could say N. That's going to be N, and this is going to be P. So N can be 1 and 2. And if you know from Excel, you can then say, you know, copy this pattern mm -hmm. for a while. And what would P be? Well, we first said that the P, the first one is zero. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we know that the first one is zero. And what's the next one? What is the next one going to equal? The next one's going to equal, what did we say? We said the box mm -hmm. right above us, the box above us, plus... 1, what was it, 1 minus the box above us? The first one would be 1 over 365. 
for n is equal to 2, would, wouldn't that be a constant, 1 over? Well, OK. Um, it will be. Well, okay, yeah, actually we could we could type in 1 over 365 here, but this formula should work too. So we should okay. be we should be able to say the box above us plus 1 minus the box above us. Mm -hmm. And then times times this number. So it ends up being this number 1 mm -hmm. and di divided by 365. Which is going to end up being 1 over 365, because this is going to be 0 plus 1 minus 0, which is 1, okay. times 1 minus 365. But the pattern will still be in place. Okay. So then this should be times, um, let's see. times um, the box before us divided by 365, and then we close parent. I hope that's right. <laughs> OK, well, hopefully that's right. I'm going to copy it just to see how it goes. So the probability of two people having the same birthday, this should be, this should, let, me, let me double check this. Let me just do 1 divided by 365 in a box out here. 1 divided by 365. Okay, so yeah, so it ends up being 1 divided by 365. So now this formula, this formula is saying we're going to, we can calculate for n equals 2 by saying the probability that all the people before us already had a match plus the probability that they all missed each other and then we come in and hit one of them match. and add it together. And now that pattern can just be copied um, by saying copy and just going along all these boxes. Mm -hmm. And we hit paste. Oh, so we have to actually go further. <laughs> so, so basically what we're saying is, um, so for example, right here, uh, if 20 people are in the room, there's a 41% chance they're going to hit, which seems, they call it a paradox, because it's not what meets the eye. So um, if we just kept going, so I think the question is, well, pretty much, as you fill out this chart, you can ask many questions about this. But uh, uh, let's just keep this pattern going and extend it a little bit more and then copy this formula to the next set of boxes. And so what we have is, OK. Um, but basically what we have is when n equals 23, we get to the point where it's 50%. So we're just saying like as, as the next person runs into the room, it's all the people before us could have had a hit, and then plus if they didn't, the new person coming in could have the hit. So it ends up being, it's, it's a little interesting that, uh, that the solution ends up being such a low number, 23. Mm -hmm. um, So, um, so that's kind of interesting. But basically, all we really did was we we were asked a question about some value n that's later on down the road, and we couldn't quite get it. If you say, well, n equals, what well, you know, what like maybe it's some calculus problem where you set up some equation and then find a, a maximum or a minimum. <clears throat> but basically, we couldn't solve it for the n that we were looking for. But we could we knew right off the top of our head what one is. And then once we knew one, we can figure out what two is. And then we realized there's a pattern. Once we knew one answer, we could always figure out the next answer. So this technique ends up being of solving a problem like this, where instead of going right at the answer, which was 23, down the road we got to 23, mm -hmm. and that came out to 0.5, whatever. Instead of searching for 23, we search for one, which got us to two, which then got us to three, and we just keep going until we hit the answer. So we are, this is kind of a called, you know, we're dynamically solving the problem. We're solving intermediate problems along the way, and then we're eventually getting to the answer. So they call this 
dynamic programming, and it doesn't mean computer programming. It just means your f a program is where you follow a sequence of steps until you arrive at the answer, mm -hmm. and then each sequence ends up changing the previous value, so the, since something's changing, they use the word dynamic. So it's not the greatest word in the world for this topic, but this topic ends up being dynamic programming. Okay, so but the but the method to solving it is not trying to solve the final problem. It's trying to solve some problem that makes you get a little bit closer to the answer, and that you slowly build till you get to the answer. Okay, um, so a different question, uh, but just keep in mind the the way of solving this problem. Um, a different question would be, and this would be a question coming out of like a. Uh, the idea of graph theory. So let's say um, we wanted to have a graph where um, put this over here. Um, and it's typical in graph theory books to have the starting point begin with S and the termination point begin with the letter T. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're starting at a certain location and you can go to another location, or you can go to this location, and from here you can go to another location, and from here you can get to where you're trying to eventually get to. Okay. And let's just say that um, you could also go from this point to this point, and you could also go from this point to this point. Now let's just say also that the graph, each one of these um, edges has a value associated with them. So let's say this is 5, this is a value of 2, um, this is a value of 1, this is a value of 2, this is a value of 1, and I'll get to what these values mean in a, in a second. Um, this could be 2, this could be 4, and this could be 2. So this could be either like, they, they could mean different things actually. They, it could be how, how long you have to travel or how many hours it would take to travel it. But there's some cost, and the cost of taking this path mm -hmm. um, is, is represented by that number. So this might be like, let's say you're trying to get from here at the college, you know, here in West Long Branch to, let's say, Philadelphia and you go on your GPS and you try to find what's the quickest way to get there. Well, there's a number of ways to get there, so there's lots of ways to get there, but hopefully your GPS tells you the one that is... Well, actually, what, what, what would you want your GPS to tell you? The one that's quickest? Or the one that... Sometimes you can set your GPS yeah. to say the yeah. uh, least avoid amount of... Avoid traffic or avoid highways and take the small road. Yeah, road. or avoid tolls, tolls like what's yeah. the cheapest toll. So there's yeah. actually a few ways you set it. And however you set it, these numbers might be the tolls. So you might set it to avoid tolls, and then a lot of these numbers would turn out zero. Mm -hmm. That would be, you know, kind of, it would be bad if it made you go out to California and come back just to avoid some tolls. But, <laughs> but um, depending on how you set it, these numbers will change. So these numbers, let's, let's say, just, just have a good understanding of what we're doing. Let's say these are the amount of time it would take to travel on that road. And now your goal is to get from the start to the termination, and our goal is to do it as quickly as possible. Okay. So looking at this with your eyes, can you see the quickest way? So let's say this was one hour, or this is two hours, this is one hour, this is five hours. I guess okay. the two, one, one, two. Yeah, so, so it's a small enough problem that it looks like here's the answer. And then this one, right? So it looks like that's the answer. Now the question is, what just went on in your head? How did you know that that's the answer? Just add it up and you know which are... Uh, yeah, and you're kind of like trying every combination, yeah. right? Because... The um, least numbers. Right. So... You, okay, so... Hmm. So you... Oh, okay. You always took the smallest path. Oh, okay, good. So, so basically, here's, here's what you did. You used what, what um, a lot of computer science textbooks would call the greedy method. Hmm. <laughs> That's like the official That's name. That's an interesting term. <laughs> 
And what you basically did was you said, I'm, I'm here and I have a choice. I could go for a cost of two or a cost of five, so I'll go two. Then, at here I have a choice, two or one, so I took one. Here you really have no choice, so you took one, and here you had no choice. So you went, every time you had a decision to make, you said, out of all my choices, I'll take the one with the, the lowest price or lowest time. Okay, and that ends up working in this case. Now, suppose we had this, the same question, and I'm going to change one, one um, let's say all of a sudden, you know, for the, for the argument, for the sake of this, uh, um, for this example, because I want to change it one number over and over, I'm going to say this is the, uh, this is the New Jersey Turnpike, this road. Mm -hmm. And have you ever taken the turnpike? Oh yeah, I and, take it okay. quite often because I'm right off. And you know how sometimes you get on it and all of a sudden it's jammed with traffic? Mm -hmm. And you're just stuck there for a long time? Okay, so um, you, I'm saying this is the New Jersey turnpike because you're always going to get stuck in traffic. You may get stuck in traffic. So you could fly or you could get really stuck. And when you're stuck, it's dead stop. It's mm -hmm. like the worst, the worst road ever when they're doing construction on it. So suppose this changed to four. Suppose it, there's tons of traffic, it's down in one lane, and now it takes four hours to go that way. Okay, now what is your answer? What's the quickest way to get from this point to this point? Uh, there are two different ways, which is going to get me there around the same time. Okay. Two, two, four. Two, two, four is eight. And five, one, two. Uh, five, one, two, okay. All right, five, one, two. It's been a whole minute in time. Uh, okay. Five, one, two. Okay, so you could go this way. Um, suppose, suppose, I'm just going to change this. Suppose uh, I made this a one. Now what's the answer? Five, one, one. It would, have, it would be this method, right, that path, right. right? And the problem was this went from, and if this was the one as before, you would be better off going this way. Mm -hmm. But now that this became a four, it's better to take this road. So your original method of saying wherever I am, take the, out of all my choices, take the smallest one, doesn't work. You're actually better off taking the five because there's a much bene a better benefit later on. Okay, so depending on whether this was a one or a four is going to change your answer. Okay, so let me, let me change this back to a two the way it was. But I just wanted to point out, the method of wherever you currently are, always take the smallest path, may not give you the best answer. Okay, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case it won't. So now the question becomes, given, if you were given this picture and told, like, just like your GPS does, when you, when you hit... GPS, it runs an algorithm like this. Mm -hmm. Find the best path. What, what would your method be? And we're not going to write any code for this, just like how would you describe it? What would you do? And I just want you to think of the birthday paradox thing, where if you can't solve it all at once, solve like a little piece, and then based on that piece, get the next piece, and then eventually try to get to the answer. So <clears throat> the idea of picking the two, so we're basically we're starting here. So let's say we want to start here, and we don't really know what's going on out here till we get there. Um, so, so from point one to point two, I would pick the least number when I start off from S. Okay. If I have to go to point two, I would pick the one which has a lesser time. Right. So, so here's one thing. Like the quickest way to get from here to here would be to take the two path. There's no way we could take the five path and then another way that is better than two. Sure. So we know the best thing we could do, the best way we can get to here is with two. Mm -hmm. Now, is that argument true for five? And let me just make this back to a one like we had before. If we had this case, is the, is the smartest way to get to this point by taking this path? Well, we at this point, at as we're doing this in increments, we know, let's first look at from where we start, mm -hmm. all the points we can get to in one hop. So, in one hop we can get to here in five. And that's it. 
These are the only two points that we can get to in one hop. Mm -hmm. Now, we say, okay, we've calculated all the one hops. Now, let's see what's the quickest way we could get to all points that we can reach in two hops. So basically, it's kind of like the birthday thing. We calculated for n equals 1, then 2, then 3. So what we're doing here is we're doing hop 1, hop 2, hop 3. So now, what points can we get to in two hops? Well, we can get to 1 hop, 2 hop. We can get to this one in two hops. Mm -hmm. We can get from here to here. We can get to this one in two hops. Mm -hmm. And we can also get to this one again in two hops. We can go hop 1, hop 2. Mm -hmm. So of all the things we could do in two hops, what's the quickest way to get there? We can go 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 1 is 3. Even though we found another method, is the 3 better? And if so, let's, because our goal is to record the best yeah. one. Let's it make this good. a 3. Yeah. That's the best way to get there. And then we could go... We, we can actually, well, now we know the best way to get there is 3, so we know to go this way and then go 1, so we can actually get... No, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. In 2 hops, we can go 5 and 1 is 6. Okay. Now the question is, now that we've calculated all the 2 hops, now let's calculate all the 3 hops. And what, when do we stop? When we eventually have calculated every path, we take the best one to get to uh, T. So in 3 hops, we can go 1, 2, 3, which is 8. Mm -hmm. But that may not be the best answer because another, another method might be better. Then we can go, so we're now doing what? Three hops. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Uh, so this is two plus one plus one. This is, we've come up with a new path that's uh -huh. four, and four is better than six. So we'll take four. And what else can we get to in three hops? Five, uh, five six. Yeah, six and two. Seven, seven, eight. So, and that's not better than eight, so the two eights, we'll call that a tie. So, have you ever used your GPS where it gives like you one method and you think another method's better, and you actually took the other method and the time doesn't change? Like it tells yeah. you, you're 12 minutes away, and then you go a different way and it says you're still 12 minutes but, away? Yeah. It basically means they had a tie, so they just picked one, one and you yeah. picked the other one and it didn't hurt you. Matter, but yeah. anyway, so that's an example where that method doesn't matter, so we'll, we'll use the first one mm -hmm. that we found. And then what else can we do on three hops? One, two, two three. Two. We did that. Okay. So now, can we do anything on four hops? One, two, three. No, that only has three hops. One, two, three, four. four. I think that's the only four three. hop three. way four, to do it. Five, six. And that ends up being six here. Six. And that ends up being our answer for the question. Because there is no way to do, that's all the four hops and there's no five hops in this thing. So we'd have to actually run a computer program that, that would calculate all this and, mm -hmm. and quickly. Um, and that's kind of the GPS thing. So now what makes it, what could make the question really interesting would be, and, and by the way, the, this, this particular, uh, the shortest path from one point to another, there's a famous person by the name of Dijkstra, D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A. So if you look up Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm on Google, it's, it's written all over the place. Oh, okay. But this is a dynamic programming approach because we can't calculate it all at once. We calculate it in waves until we get to the final answer. What if, now this is something, um, if I wanted to introduce probability, what if you don't, let's say your GPS doesn't tell you about traffic, mm -hmm. or you, you could... Uh, you could, your GPS can tell you to get on the turnpike, and then all of a sudden there's a big accident, and now you're stuck in traffic, but you didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. So suppose, now remember, if this was a 1 or a 4, mm -hmm. would, it, would make us, if it's a 1, we would take it, and if it's a 4, we wouldn't take it. What if it could be a 1 or a 4? And just, just to make it kind of easy, let's say there's a 50% chance it's a 1 and a 50% chance it's a 4. Because, you know, there might be traffic or there might not be, and your GPS can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. And your goal is to have the lowest expected time. So this is a question you might not see in a computer algorithms book, but we're now going to add that there's one event that has a probability to it, something we can't control. So if it was one, we would take it. 
-hmm. If there was no traffic on the turnpike, we'd take it. Okay. And it would be two plus one, three, four, five, six. So if there's no traffic, uh, so if the value was, if the turnpike <laughs> equaled one, mm -hmm. we would take it and it would take us six hours okay. to get to where we're going. If the turnpike equals four, meaning there's, they're doing construction, we wouldn't take it and we would do two, four, eight. eight. We would do eight. What if we didn't know there may or may not be traffic, and suppose there's a 50-50 chance, would you take it? So this is just a kind of a twist to the shortest path algorithm because one of, one of the parts has a probability to it. Would you take it? And suppose the chance was 50-50. 50% chance it'll take one hour, 50% chance it'll take four hours, and all you care about is minimizing your average expected time. Mm -hmm. So what would you do? Well, if it's a, there's a 50% chance it'll be one. So, so now we're looking at it from the point of view of we're taking it. If we take it, what, is it, what do we expect? Well, there's a 50% chance it'll be one. Okay. So, so that would be six. And there's a 50% chance there's going to be traffic and we're going to get stuck. And we're going to end up going two, four, which is six. And you know you can't make any U-turns. Let's say six, seven, eight, nine. nine. So there's a fifty percent chance it'll be six, and a fifty percent chance it'll be nine. So we take the average, and we get seven and a half. Mm -hmm. Seven and a half is better than saying I don't want to deal with it. I'd rather skip it, which would be eight. So if we care about the ex best expected average time, we would take it. It might be six, it might be nine, but the average is seven and a half. If we don't take it, it's going to be eight. eight. Yeah. And what if, and you might be able to just uh, convince yourself, if the choices were two and five, mm -hmm. uh, with a two, we would still take it. Two, four, five. Yeah, four, five, seven, seven, as opposed to eight. Correct. Two, we would take it, and five, we would not take it. Right, two, seven, eight, nine, ten, as opposed to eight. eight. Yeah. And in that case, the averages would be, so basically I just added one to each of them. So instead of uh, six plus nine, it would be seven plus ten. So we'd have an average of eight and a half. So if the choice for this was two or five, mm -hmm. we would not take it. Yeah. But if the choice was one or four, we would take it and just, you know, hope for the best. So we can actually, so we would be, so, so in that case, we would be solving the problem dynamically for a certain number here, mm -hmm. decide whether to take it or not, then solve it dynamically for a different number and decide whether to take it or not, and then put the probabilities together. What if now, if the probability of it was not either 50% 2 or 50% 5, but it was like kind of uniformly distributed between 1 and 5? Okay. You could say this could get, this, like, let's say, so between 1 and 5, it has equal chance? Well, um, if it was between, so basically if it's three, uh -huh. um, we, don't, we could take it or leave it, right? Three is the middle of the room. Right. What if it was somewhere between one and five with an average of three, then it might, we, the answer might be that we don't care, we'll take it or not take it. But what if the distribution was something not uniform or not like a normally distributed, some odd di distribution, mm -hmm. what would we end up doing? At this point, we might have to use simulation. We might have to say, let's just try every possibility between one and five uh, based okay. on that distribution and just see what's the best answer and then sum them all up. And Pick a random number between one and five and... Uh, and then, five. yeah, and then call that distribution to see what's the chance we're there. Correct. And then assume that that's what the value is between one and five and then calculate it. And just try 20,000, 20 million mm -hmm. experiments and decide whether to go. Okay, so it's just, it's another way of solving kind of the same problem. Um, again, you, you solve it in stages. Mm -hmm. And if we add a, a part that has a probability, so basically the whole, the, all the numbers are frozen except for one. I let one move around. But if you think about it, what if we started letting them all move around? <laughs> then it becomes this, you know, then you'd have no choice but to, to run, you know, experiments over and over and just find the best one. So another type of example that would have prob um, 
dynamic programming as a solution, meaning solving it in stages. Um, and we could just talk about this just a little bit. Um, would be if you have seats on an airplane. So suppose you had, and just to make things easier, suppose we had an airplane with 100 seats. So I guess we'd have four to a row and 25 rows, something like that. But I just want to use 100 seats on an airplane. Mm -hmm. And let's just say, let's just suppose that um, suppose for some reason I told you just uh, just to have a, re a really simple example. Suppose I said if you sell the seats at a hundred dollars a piece, I know that you will get exactly eighty people to show up. Eighty people will buy tickets, and it's so we, what's that? If it's hundred dollars per ticket, right? If it's a hundred dollars per ticket, you'll get eighty people buying them. And you'll end up getting eight thousand dollars, and plus twenty empty seats. But if you sell it for two hundred dollars, then you'll get fifty people. Mm -hmm. the, the higher you make the price, the less Lower. people will show up. And you'll collect ten thousand dollars, and you'll have uh, fifty empty seats. Now, if we lived in a world where you're only allowed to charge 100 or 200, this would make sense. But the truth, what would be the real world um, pr price? You know, we, we could actually charge you know, 129 dollars, 150. Yeah. You can pick all kinds of numbers. There's going to be some number that, if you made it so low, you'd be 100 percent certain the plane will fill up, right? So um, what's that number? Yeah, right. So what's that number? So obviously zero. Like if you said free flights to Europe. The plane's going to fill up, right? <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, but even if you made it 50 bucks to fly to Europe, the plane will fill up. Yeah. So there's going to be some number. Let's just say, based on historical data, it was 59 bucks. Guarantees 100 people. 100 people, so that's $5,900. And then there's going to be some price that I can assure you nobody will buy. Like a million dollars, nobody's getting on the plane, right? So there's going to be some number that just, it's going to be times zero people. See. And you're going to make zero. So the total will go from 59, it'll grow up, and then eventually come down to zero as we make the price go up and down. Mm -hmm. So our goal, if we're running an airline, <laughs> is to pick the price that gives us the most money. And a couple of assumptions, like uh, if the plane is half empty, we're not going to save any money on gas, or you know, it's cheaper to fly half as many people. Let's say nothing like that. Okay, so, so how would we do this? Well, we could look at past data to find out, well, if we set the price to this, we're going to only get this many people and so mm -hmm. on. So we go looking for the best price. So that's one issue when, trying, when airlines are trying to pick the best price to charge you. Obviously, they're competing against other airlines that have to take that into account. Yeah. But then it turns out that, and this was back in the 1970s, before the 1970s, airlines just used to charge like one price. It was like buying a sweater. Either ah. you just, you know, the price, it's 100 bucks and take it or leave That's it. it. Yeah. So they started to realize that there's a lot of people who, that, that okay, there are certain people who will plan a vacation, right? And if you're going to plan a vacation, you know... Um, you, you usually know way in advance you're going on vacation, like like spring break is coming up. So, but you knew months ago spring break was next yeah. week. So, um, so if you were going to plan a vacation, you could have planned it months ago. Yeah. But there's also people who travel. Um, they travel like business travel, like oh, there's a deal. We needed to go to Hong Kong to close this deal tomorrow, and you only found out yesterday. So, okay. people who don't know way in advance that they're going to be traveling yeah. are willing to pay a lot more money than people who, who can plan in advance. So all of a sudden, they started to notice that the data they came up with, like how many people will pay 200, how many people will pay 300, if you said to people, um, I'll give you a discount if you book 30 days in advance, mm -hmm. you would think some people would book 30 days, you would think this number would drop because they'll be buying it at the okay. cheaper airfare. But a lot of times they don't know it. So it has very little effect on this. So they could say things like, they could come up with prices like, um, you know, $2.99 mm -hmm. if you book 30 days in advance. 
and then it's like six ninety nine. If not, you've seen this when you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So, but what they're doing is they've noticed that if they give this out, uh -huh. it really won't cause the number of people who pay the big price to drop because a lot of those people don't know until a day or two before the flight they're even going. It might be a little bit. Maybe somebody, if they didn't do this, then some people might say, well, I'm going on vacation at spring break and I'll look up, I'll log in the night before I leave and buy an yeah. airfare ticket. So now they know they have to go 30 days in advance. But it didn't affect this much, th this amount too much. So they started to notice that the empty seats become valuable because you can sell the empty seats 30 days in advance mm -hmm. and it doesn't affect this computation Good. too much. Okay. So now you're not only looking for the one with the best price, but the one with the best price plus the extra empty okay. seats. And you can do other things with the empty seats, like uh, frequent flyer mile, you know. There's ways to have value for the seats that you can't sell to the business class people. Um, so what we'll end up doing is we'll look at problems. This is, again, it's going to be solved like a dynamic programming problem. But the answer might look something like this. We might say we have an airplane with 100 seats. Um, how many, so the question might be like, how many do we save for, bu for business people? Mm -hmm. And how many do we save for vacationers? So by business people, you mean the number well, of empty... Well, the only, we can't control, we can't say to people, you can only buy the ticket if you're going on business. Perfect. But, um, but, but we'll make the assumption if people can book 30 days in advance, they're probably vacationers. And if it's less than that, they're business people. They also, you ever, you ever see rules that say, uh, if you stay over Saturday night, it's cheaper? Yeah, now you figure seven what? days of the week are cheaper than when you travel on the other day. Right. What they're doing, they're looking for business people because they know business people will pay the most. So if you're going on a business trip, business is Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. So they figure if you fly Tuesday and come home Friday, that's a business trip. But if you fly Wednesday and come home the following Monday, then your company had to keep you in a hotel over the weekend, which will be expensive and they may not want that. Yep. So that's why they say if you stay over Saturday night, it's cheaper because they're just guessing you're a vacation or not a business, business. person. That's the whole logic to it. So they know the business people will pay the most, then the vacationers a second, and then they also have frequent flyer clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, frequent flyer. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to say, so the, the way the frequent flyer thing ends up working is um, you tell people if they spend, give you money some other way, you'll give them free seats on a plane. So you, you, you give them a credit card, and as long as they use it, you give yeah. them points for something. So we're basically going to say, our answers are going to be something like, let 10 seats go to the frequent flyers, mm -hmm. another 18 seats on top of that go to the vacationers, yeah. and then the remainder are business. And we want to, so we want to come up with uh, these numbers. Uh, so it'll be 10, and then a total of 28. You know, 10 of these plus 18 more mm -hmm. makes a total of 28 go to uh, vacationers and business people. And, and then we could also do a thing where we have uh, the other tricks they use at the airlines is um, people who really pay a lot of money. Um, first class. Yeah. So, yeah, so we could also put a line here like saying that, you know, um, the first 10 seats are first class, then the next up to 78 are, they can, you know, for business people, mm -hmm. then up to 8 and up to 90 are vacationers, Vacation. and the rest are frequent flyers. So what we're really searching for is this set of numbers to solve the problem. How many and, for business and how many for uh, vacation? Is, is that the number that you're trying to get to? or? Yeah, how many seats, so when we reserve the plane, we want to say how many seats uh, do we reserve for each section mm -hmm. because we believe we can, we believe we can fill up 10 first class seats, but once we start looking for an 11th and a 12th, they may go empty. So we'll set it at 10 and we decide how many seats are first class seats on the plane. 
and then how many people, how many seats do we reserve for business? So if somebody calls up, do you use frequent flyer miles? Yes. Okay. Do you have a call up and they say, oh, we, you can't fly yeah. that day? Oh, yeah, many times. But the plane may have empty seats on it, Absolutely. but you can't fly yeah. because yeah. they've only allowed 10 allowed for frequent the, flyers and 10 the allotted the number of seats are taken, so they don't care. Yeah. yeah, so you have to move to another plane. So even though the plane, you, you might, they might say, well, we don't have any frequent flyer seats for you, but if you want to pay 500 yeah. bucks, you can. Yeah. So that's really what they're doing. They're figuring out how many go into each section, mm -hmm. and then once it fills up, they stop it. Right. But their, their goal, they're trying to get as much money out of the plane as they can by figuring out the best numbers to use for these. So that's really, that's what we'll end up doing. Now, as you can imagine, this is all based on probability. This is all based on who flew last year and or last History month. History and yeah. And you can't guess it right, so we're just going to keep running experiments over and over until we get the best possible numbers we can.